The U.S. Department of Energy is cleaning up the Oak Ridge Reservation of residual hazardous and radioactive contamination left over as a result of decades of nuclear energy research. Much of that work has been influenced by the Oak Ridge Site-Specific Advisory Board, a citizens panel that provides independent advice and recommendations on DOE's cleanup operations. You're welcome to attend the meetings and be part of this important work. For more information, call us or visit our website. Ladies and gentlemen of the board, honored guests, we're glad to have you. Uh, happy New Year, happy 2014. This is the first meeting of the Site-Specific Advisory Board for 2015. Hope everyone had a good Christmas and happy New Year. Pardon me, Mr. Dr. Jimmy Bell. Uh, I am the man sitting in this chair with the on microphone <laughs> who forgot his gavel. Uh, please turn off your electronic communication devices, pagers, phones, uh, fax machines, whatnot. We have two exits to this building. If you need assistance from anyone, we'll be more than happy to help you with that. And to the board members, please use your microphone while we are while talking at the meeting. And during the question and answer period, the board members will be called upon first, and then we will go to the public, and then back to board members if there is enough time. Uh, our next meeting will be February 11th, and the presentation will be about the sufficient waste disposal capacity on the Oak Ridge Reservation. Tonight's meeting presentation will provide an overview of Zone 1 proposed soils for the East Tennessee Technology Park, and our presenter is uh, Wendy Kane. At this point, I think I'll ask if there's any comments from the deputy-designated federal officer and we'll start with uh, Mr. Adler, who will cover two hats tonight. That's correct. Um, I'm covering for Sue Cange tonight as she's on her way back from Washington, hopefully getting home sometime in the next couple of hours. Um, it's a couple of things. First of all, thanks to everybody coming out. Thanks to a fairly large group of uh, members of the public that are showed up tonight, too. Um, I'm glad because the presentation for tonight is, is it about a pretty big deal. Um, the central subject is an effort to define all remaining environmental restoration and land use control requirements for a large tract of land out at the East Tennessee Technology Park, over about a 1,000 acres of land, roughly half of which will end up probably in a conservation, recreational land use type setting, the other half of which we hope to develop for industrial purposes, creating jobs and allowing us to reuse the East Tennessee Technology Park. It's really what we've been trying to do with the cleanup program. So there are a lot of tough issues associated with doing this. It's one of the first times that DOE will have done it on this large of a scale. Um, we've been working on it for a long time, but that's okay. It's okay if it takes us a little bit longer to get it done because it's important that we get this right. Um, that's pretty much all I'll say about that. I just wanted to stress that it's really a pretty important topic and one of the most important things that we're asking the uh, board to provide us their input on this year. So I'm sure Sue would agree with that. If I could, I'd just like to introduce uh, Carl Frode. Carl, if you'll just raise your hand. <laughs> Connie is, uh, Carl is with EPA. Connie is virtually present somehow. Um, she couldn't make it up here for this trip, but she'll be present via the phone. Carl is also with EPA Region 4, and he has worked with us on a lot of activities across the reservation, a lot of work, and he's going to be helping us out some at ETTP over the next few years, probably also. So I think that's all I wanted to mention, unless folk have any questions I'd like to ask right up front. Not, I'll hand it off to Thank Chris. Thank you, Mr. Adler. Sure. Uh, is Connie on the phone? Does she have any comments she wants to make tonight? Yes, I am on the phone. You, uh, no, I don't have any comments. agree with that this is an area project. Um, I'm working for quite a while for at least this for TV. Well, thank you very much. We look forward to seeing you. I hope you'll come back up here and visit with us one of these days. <laughs> I plan to before I see you. Okay. Thank you, Connie. Next is public comment period. Ms. Rowcliffe? The public comment period is now open. Um, it appears there's only one name on the list, so David Martin. David Martin, uh, old uh, board member from way back and still on the EM stewardship. 
Uh, hey, this is uh, this is big big deal here. The beginning of the end. Uh, our stewardship and also the board has gotten a lot of good information on Zone One over uh, quite a number of years, and I expect the presentation tonight to be equally as good. By the way, I also serve on the Rome County Environmental Advisory Board, which just happens to be having a meeting tomorrow night at 6 o'clock at the courthouse, Rome County Courthouse. Everybody's invited. We're going to be talking about the modification to the landfill permit for the Kingston Steam Plant and also the modification of the NPDES permit for uh, doing some uh, hydrogen capture, uh, excuse me, mercury capture in the flue gases. So please come if, uh, if you're interested. Um, two things real quick. First of all, for the DOE, uh, a lot of good work, a lot of hard work to get to this point, and I think we all appreciate that. And, you know, you, you're the guys, y'all have got the brains, you've got the science behind what's going on here. And I really hope that the DOE gets out in front early on this and gives us the, the, the public good advice on, you know, just what is realistic on this, on this zone one. Uh, we don't need to be looking around and dealing with stuff that when you get right down to it, it won't work out. So, so get up front and tell us how, you know, what can we do with this? And one of the, one of the tools that y'all have that we don't really have is your ability to go around the country and talk to other sites that have done other, that have started doing things like this and see what, what their capabilities have been and what they are. And we, I think we'd all like to hear what, what you'd find out if you did that. As for the board, uh, and when I sit down in a minute, you're going to see a map up here that's going to show Zone 1 and Zone 2. And what hits me when I look at that map, and I've looked at it a number of times, is Zone 1 looks like a very big old hand up there holding back Zone 2 from the wetlands and from the Clinch River. I'll leave you with that. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public who want to comment? As a Citizens Advisory Board to the Department of Energy on Environmental Cleanup, we want to encourage the community at large to attend and participate in our board and committee meetings. If you're unable to attend, please send in your questions and comments to the address shown. Appropriate comments and questions will be read during the public comment section of the SSAB meeting and will be given the same consideration by the board and DOE as those given in person. Meeting schedules and ways to communicate with the board can be obtained by calling 2414583 or by visiting our website. Thank you very much. Very well done. Thank you, Mr. Martin, for your comments. Up next, on, up next on the agenda is a presentation for this evening. And Ms. Lyons, would you introduce our presenter, please? Uh, yes. Uh, Wendy Kane is a portfolio federal project manager, project director for the Department of Energy's Oak Ridge Office of Environmental Management. She's responsible for the planning and execution of EM cleanup, decontamination, and decommissioning, waste storage, and disposal operations at the East Tennessee Technology Park formerly the K-25 gaseous diffusion plant. Wendy has been with DOE for over 20 years and joined the Oak Ridge Environmental Management Program in 1998. Wendy's career also included four years with DOE Technical Leadership Development Program that included details at three field sites and a headquarters program office. Wendy has a bachelor's degree in industrial engineering from West Virginia University and a master's degree in industrial engineering and environmental management from the University of Tennessee. Please welcome Wendy Kane. It is a pleasure to be here with you this evening to talk about our path forward for the Zone 1 Final Soils proposed plan. Uh, it's a pleasure to see many of you again. It was nice to, to meet many of our board members at the holiday get-together that we had in December. Understand that several of the EM and um, long-term stewardship committee members went out to ETTP and toured the Zone 1 areas with Dave in November. I'm sorry to have missed you on, on that tour, but I hope you uh, had a, a, got a good perspective of our sites out there. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge Connie uh, Jones, Carl Frode, and uh, Randy Hoffmeister with TDEC, who are part of our team as we work through our uh, Zone 1 remedial action objectives. 
I understand since we have some new members on the board, I'd like to give you a little bit of, of a background, so I'll try to move through some of this quickly so we can get to the, the good stuff. Um, most of you are familiar with where ETTP is located. We are in the, the northwest corner of the Oak Ridge Reservation on the, out in Roan County. And so um, the yellow blot to the far left on the screen is East Tennessee Technology Park. The end state for ETTP is to become a commercial industrial park. And you know, our, our end state uses in our zone two and zone one documentation is for unrestricted industrial use to 10 feet. The, what I like about this picture is it's a good snapshot of zone one and zone two. We've got some photos that I'll show that are diagrams and maps. But this area right here, the main plant area, is what we call zone two. And that's where our heavy industrial activities took place. It's approximately 800 acres. The area around the plant, including Duck Island and the powerhouse, is what's known as Zone 1. We had some light industrial activities and some waste management activities in those area, but areas. But a lot of Zone 1 has, was unimpacted by the operations and support activities for the Oak Ridge gas use diffusion plant since the 40s. So uh, we have a great opportunity. We'll see our progress as we've um, gone through the Zone 1 interim soils process and our progress on characterizing our actions and releasing those. We'll walk through those. Um, but this is a good snapshot of, of ETTP and it's, it's kind of the first, our, my introduction to our ultimate end state for ETTP to be an industrial park when we're done. So as I mentioned, ETTP was split into two zones for the purposes of our evaluations and clearing um, to take, make sure that we take care of our remedial actions. I mentioned zone one, approximately 1,400 acres, and zone two, the main plant area is approximately 800 acres. David referenced the, uh, the length that some of our activities have, have been going on with respect to our final proposed plan that we have now for zone one. Originally that started out focusing on the, the whole site-wide um, RIFS and ROD for all environmental media. So we had interim soils decisions, but we needed to come back and, and cover our final decisions for the whole site. Uh, we've had a, a, an evolution of starts and stops over time uh, for a variety of reasons. And in 2010, we agreed with EPA and TDEC to move forward with an accelerated zone one final rod for, for all media. Through the course of our process there, we ran into some hiccups trying to address all of the media with this final rod and we moved into informal dispute um, that was invoked by EPA in 2013. Through the course of our discussions, we agreed to defer surface water and groundwater decisions and be able to have a final soils rod. And some of our activities since that time, we've issued a D3 of our remedial investigation feasibility study and our proposed plan. We received comments on the D1 proposed plan and in November issued a D2. I should apologize, on the left of the screen, I highlighted some of our key documents for the CERCLA process because since we may have some, some newcomers, we tend to use a lot of acronyms and so, um, You'll hear of the, the Remedial Investigation Feasibility Study as the RIFS or RIFS. Uh, the proposed plan will abbreviate as PP, the ROD, of course, Record of Decision. And I highlighted the proposed plan as kind of the, the we are here spot um, it, with respect to the CERCLA process for our Zone 2 Final Soils ROD. The, the Zone 1 area is kind of defined in, into four geographical areas. The, in, on the, the diagram, Zone 1 is in the yellow. So the part north of Zone 2, the top is, is known as the K901 area. And I am definitely not tall enough to reach that. Uh, <laughs> Duct Island is this area, the powerhouse area here. And the 1007 ponds are here, so way up there on top of the plant is 901. So all of our, um, air, or all of our actions and things are kind of categorized into those four geographical areas. We've taken quite a few actions over the years in Zone 1, and I'm not going to, to read down through the list of those for you. Um, 
they will get copies of the presentation oh, yeah. we're done okay um, but we just got a summary of the, the actions that we've taken in zone one over the years I don't think there was anything there that I specifically wanted to highlight So moving into our progress on the Zone 2 interim rod, Zone 1, sorry, the Zone 1 interim rod was signed in 2002, and that established our soil cleanup goals for worker protection and protecting groundwater. Our goal was for the unrestricted industrial use of the first 10 feet of land in Zone 1. We identified exposure units that our team then went forth to characterize and evaluate against the criteria in the rod to determine if other actions were taken or if it was sufficient to be cleared. Um, and we also identified and removed sources of groundwater contamination. We've covered quite a lot of ground since our, both our Zone 1 interim rod and our Zone 2 rods were signed. The Zone 2 was signed in 2005. Um, you can see all the areas that are in green on the map are exposure units, again, the areas that we bucket to use for our evaluation and um, determining either no further action or that all the appropriate actions have been taken to, to clear an area, um, have been completed. So we've been able to meet the ROD goals in 71 of the 80 exposure units in Zone 1. Um, we've got lots of statistics there on the work, the, the work that we've done to get there, but that's probably the key message. Uh, we, do, we did identify a few areas that were not able to meet our interim rod goals. The contractor spoilers area, the 720 fly ash area, 770 scrap yard area, and the duct banked corridor. And again, we've also, as I mentioned, um, this deferred the, the final those areas were defined, um, deferred to this final soils rod for additional evaluation for how to deal with those areas. And that'll be a good portion of our proposed action and of course the evaluations and things that we've, that we've gone through. So the final RIFS for our zone one soils built upon what we had already started for the site-wide RIFS. We incorporated the zone one rod goals and evaluated some of the other actions that we had taken that were not part of the record of decision for Zone 1. We also performed risk assessments to um, determine, we're looking in some areas of, of with the recreational use and some of the things that may happen in our Zone 1 area. So we looked at the recreational user and evaluated how um, that risk might be impacted, I guess impact is not the right word, um, but how that compared to the evaluation we had previously done just for the industrial workers. And we've also identified alternatives for those areas that I mentioned had not met the Zone 1 objectives to determine what our next actions may be if necessary. The conclusions from the remedial investigation determined that the unrestricted industrial use um, was also protective of our recreational users and that the cleanup levels that we used for unrestricted industrial use were also protective for our recreational use. We did identify a few potential risks, and I've captured those on this slide, but they're also in the proposed plan on table six, I believe. Let me check my reference. We have the risks on table six. We um, did not identify any unacceptable risk to groundwater in the areas that were identified. You can see the, the nature of the risks that were identified. So the key areas and issues that we were addressing with the Zone 1 um, rod are identifying what remedy may be needed for those areas that didn't meet our interim rod goals, selecting the final land use controls that we would need for Zone 1, and then identifying and establishing our path forward for the ecological risk. So the remedial action objectives that we have for our final Zone 1 proposed plan and rod are similar to what we've used in the past. The first one, the second one that I'll, I'll read for those that might not be able to see that, are what we had for Zone 1 interim rod with the exception of now consideration for our recreational users. 
So we're looking at the industrial use at a minimum of the depth of 10 feet for the majority of zone one, protecting future industrial workers from exposure to contamination in soils. And again, with the, the alternatively also protecting the recreational users from exposure to contaminants in soils. And then the other one that was similar to our interim rod, or the same as our interim rod, was protecting the underlying groundwater and nearby surface water from contamination in soils. The middle objective, protecting local level terrestrial wildlife receptors population from contamination in surface soils over the habitat areas was the same as our initial site-wide goal from the RIFS. So the four alternatives that we evaluated in the RIFS were the standard no action. And then from there, our range of, of alternatives um, progressed to include more areas of excavation. So the first one was additional land use controls and cover for K770 in our contractor spoils area. All four areas that, that uh, I had mentioned previously where we had the risks, contractor spoils area, 720, and the duct bank areas. And then we were removing the small ecological risk areas that had been identified. The nuance with uh, the alternative three was removing K770 plus those small ecological areas. And then the nuance or the addition, the progressive excavation for alternative four was removing K770, the K720 fly ash, and the small ecological risk areas. The preferred alternative is the second alternative. Keeping the 770 cover and having that cover or covering 770 to a depth of two feet to prevent exposure to the asbestos that's in, um, in the 770 area. Removing the ecological risk areas that were identified. Maintaining for the long term our covers at the contractor spoils area, K720 and the 770 area that would be added. Um, maintaining our land use controls, perhaps some additional land use controls as might be, be necessary, um, controlling our access below 10 feet. Again, we're focusing on the unrestricted use down to 10 feet. Um, there's a, an area in the duck bank corridor in 770 that would have a two foot protection and having groundwater use restrictions. So there's some of the land use controls that um, are considered as part of that, that proposal. Some of the key considerations um, and our rationale for uh, proposing the second alternative was balancing the trade-off with the cost of remediation and the effort level protection that the remediation would provide. And this is described in detail on page 33 in our proposed plan. We also wanted to ensure that we could effectively control access to areas um, where there may be residual contamination, our ability long-term to do that and providing a cost-effective, uh, cost um, long-term ability to maintain something long-term and not necessarily relying on covers for areas where we had the issue with the um, ecological, ecological risk receptors in the Duck Island area. One of the, the key factors, and it's not really a key factor, but something that uh, makes zone one particularly exciting is as I'd mentioned previously so much of the zone one area was unimpacted by the Oak Ridge gaseous diffusion plants activities and so we have some some great potential for um, reuse and really achieving that long-term mission that we have at ETTP for a commercial industrial park. Um, there are two areas as you, you've noticed that um, have a couple of decisions that need to be made through this proposed plan and rod process, and that's the powerhouse and the duct area. But we've had we've um, made some significant progress in transferring property and working through the regulatory process to be in the position to to transfer property. Uh, we're advancing in the duct out duct island and former powerhouse area, going through the the regulatory process to transfer those lands. Um, We've already transferred over 700 acres um, and have leased 530 acres for, for commercial reuse. And, and we're, as we're migrating from leased areas to the, the longer term um, 
transfer. This is an important step to, to finalize these actions so that we can move forward and make areas available as appropriate for additional commercial interests. As I mentioned, the powerhouse has two of the key areas that we, we still have a decision to be made as part of this, the K770 area and our K720 fly ash area. Um, the powerhouse is one of the largest parcels that we have as a, as a I guess, a one package for um, the clearance and working with uh, the EPA and our headquarters to be able to transfer that property. And it's pretty, I guess, enticing or attractive because of some of the other nuances of that that site in particular has. And then I, I put um, an old picture, and I'm not sure, I don't know where this picture came from the archives, but the powerhouse area circa 1945, and, and you can see the, the powerhouse uh, in the in the forefront and some of the, the other activities. And, and it was a little bit of a, of a happen in place, probably the most happen in of, of all of zone one. But when we look at all the activities that, and things that were going on there and look at the, the powerhouse area today, um, it's level, it's right on the water. There's a, there's a lot of opportunity here as we, as, you know, when we're able to, to identify the final actions that we need to take, take those actions and make make those that land could, available. Could you go Do back you, one slide? There's one thing sure. I point out. I wasn't um, there, so I'm not sure <laughs> <laughs> I could. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't but, born yet either. But once, <laughs> uh, two of the areas that Bad this ones. decision, this this project makes decisions on, are this area, where those are fuel tanks, and those fuel tanks were insulated with asbestos containing insulin. And while the tanks have been gone, most of the asbestos is gone also, there's a little bit of asbestos in the soil there. You can dig for a long time. If you start to do that, you get into groundwater pretty quickly because you're not far above the river at that point. The proposal, and Wendy's proposal, is to cover that with soil, which would allow people to reuse the land but also protect them from the asbestos. And then this area over here somewhere is, is, is labeled as a coal storage yard, but there's also an ash pile in this area. They take the coal over, burn it, take the ash back out and pile it up over there. Um, that's another one of the units that we're making a decision on as part of this remedy. Mm -hmm. And there, too, a cap is proposed. Um, for the rest of the area, they're basically look, looking at uh, freeing the ground to a depth of 10 feet. Um, one last thing. You can see K20. It's just kind of an interesting picture. You can see K25 in the background. So Wendy and Jim Capote have already torn that down. This is K27. Which is her next big challenge, um, and the reason why that area collectively, this is Duck Island in the middle. It's not really an island; it's a peninsula. <laughs> but we call it a Duck Island for yeah. 20 years, so I stop now. Um, because of the original features of the site, it used enormous amounts of power, had rail access, barge access. Now it has interstate access. It's a pretty attractive site for industrial development. And the biggest part, the biggest opportunity for economic <coughs> development, once we've finished up the K33 area, um, back in zone two, will be this area and this area. So. Thank you. Sure. It looks a lot prettier there, but maybe it's just because it's in color. And it's not, there's not as much going on. So um, we do have a couple of activities going on now. We have. Um, the K1313 F facility is really the only DOE activity in this area. We've, um, we're storing sodium shields there, and I've promised Dave and many others, I have a personal objective to get those off site. So we're, we're pursuing that and hope sooner rather than later to be able to, to declare victory on that. And we have the wood forestry, forestry products. Um, it's a, a lease -E that's working in the, the powerhouse area as well. Um, but, but again, very, very attractive as, as soon as we can make our final decisions and take whatever necessary actions we have in the, at least in the powerhouse area, but certainly all of zone one. So our path forward um, for kind of next steps related to first the proposed plan and then our subsequent actions, uh, we do have some comments from the re regulators that um, will cause us to need to revise our proposed plan. So we'll be doing that within the next several weeks and plan to, to issue a revision. Um, 
We expect that that will be sufficient, we hope, um, anticipate that we'll be able to get regulatory approval of that. That would then kick off the public comment period and we'll have our public meetings scheduled accordingly. Uh, in the meantime, we'll continue working with the regulators on some land use control options that we have and some um, considerations, one to facilitate the reindustrialization program, but to just ensure that we um, get all of the issues taken care of that, that have come up through the course of comments and our comment resolution. Um, we anticipate just kind of keeping with a standard review and approval protocol that would guide us towards having the regulatory approval of the, the Zone 1 rod by the end of the calendar year and then we would begin initiating the corrective or the um, remedial actions to address those. And again, our, um, our future site-wide rod would pick up the, the final decision on the groundwater and surface water um, risks that have been identified. And that's, that's the last page. So is it normal protocol just to open it up for questions or do I get to sit down? Or? Well, that, that, that depends. <laughs> we do have some questions. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Bell? What are the basis for the uh, rod criteria and who developed the rod criteria? Oh, gosh. The, the, I mean, yeah, the, I, I mean, try. I can I, say I, generically, was, you might have a more detail. I was actually around when, when that was taking place, so I'll take a crack at that. Um, the, the basic objective is we need to have criteria that ensure protectiveness, right? Plus what? Protectiveness. We have, to, we have to leave the land in a safe place for the intended reuse. That's a qualitative statement. From there, what we do is we look at, it gets kind of technical, we look at the contaminants that are present mm -hmm. um, and identify risk-based criteria for the contaminants in soil. Two, actually three reasons. Um, one, to make sure that an industrial worker, and I believe the scenario posited was an industrial worker that gets in and digs around perhaps in a trenching operation, has the uh, inhalation dosing and then some minimal ingestion dosing, um, is not put in harm's way. A second thing that we develop criteria for is to make sure that there's not a sufficient concentration of contaminants in the soil column to serve as a source of continued groundwater degradation. So that's the second thing. And then the third thing, and it's a little bit trickier because the science isn't as evolved, is to come up with criteria that are suitable to ensure that our, the flora and fauna on the grounds are not impacted. Now there we weren't attempting to ensure that every blade of grass was safe, but we were trying to come up with criteria that would, that would ensure that the ecosystem was healthy. Um, now, given that the ecosystem for much of the area, we hope in the future to be an industrial park, the actual you know, wildlife considerations aren't as great as they might be in a national park, for example. But basically, they're risk-based criteria set up to ensure that workers are safe, that we don't have continuing degradation of groundwater, and we don't have any significant threat to the non-human receptors. You mentioned the radionuclides being part of the consideration. And, and in phase one, I would think that'd be very minimal uh, out there in zone one. Uh, That's correct. There, there wasn't what, a lot what, what of... What was considered to be of importance out there that might be a contamination? We, we of course, that was a big uranium mill, right? Uranium yeah, right. purification plant. So um, one of the main things we looked for was uranium. There was not a lot of uranium to be found in the soils around the site because of the nature of the industrial processing sure. taking place under vacuum and so forth. A little bit here and there. Um, some of the uh, other just traditional industrial systems like power distribution systems, um, come with some heavy metal contaminants that need to be worked on. And then because it was a large industrial site, of course, there are solvents, degreasing solvents and fuels and so forth that we look for. But there, as she mentioned, only 80,000 cubic yards of soil were removed total. It's really not a, on a site that's close to 2,000 acres. That's not a lot of dirt to clean up. We did not have a lot of major excavation work to do to meet our criteria. But other than the old power plant, uh, what was there to cause concern about future use of that soil, that area? And 
And what did what happened to the ash from that power plant? It, the ash is stored on site there, and frankly, a lot of what we do is we spend money, all of our money, um, to prove the absence of problems. You start out with an area that's been known to be used for industrial purposes during a war effort with minimal regulation. So we go out and do a lot of characterization of the land to get the data, which in most land areas proves it to be unimpacted land. That's, that's our principal experience out there. In isolated areas where there may have been some specific industrial activity or some disposal activity, we, we find some things and clean them up. But most of the most of the characterization shows the area to be clean. Thank you, Dave. One, sure. one more? Go ahead. We've got a couple after you, Jim. The, uh, the sodium shields in that building that you mentioned, mm -hmm. I assume, came from the reactor over at X-10. It, it did. Is the sodium still in the shields? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not, yeah, I mean... And so there, it's, there are multiple shields, but that's still contained. So what are the plans for getting rid of that? Uh, that's got to go and, and process that sodium somewhere before you can. We're in the process now of evaluating several options for quite a while. We, it just sat in the K1313F facility, but we have um, a couple of promising alternatives that are being evaluated now to see one, what we can afford to do and how, what, I think the more of the driver now is how quickly we can, we can get there. So um, there, there are a couple of options that are under evaluation now, pursuing, pursuing um, working with the appropriate regulatory folks for where it might be disposed to see if we can get the, if we can meet the waste acceptance criteria where it would go. And so um, we're, we're targeting, I'm personally targeting in Scott's in the room, <laughs> the end of the fiscal year to, to, have a, to have an answer, maybe not necessarily have it gone, but there's an opportunity to, to, to even, uh, I think, excel beyond that. So a um, couple of things that we're looking at. Did you mention what you're going to do with it? What you going to I, I did not because we, we don't have an approved <laughs> outlet yet, so we're evaluating options that, that appear promising. So um, I'd rather not elaborate on those until we... We know for sure that they're viable, or else we're back to the drawing board. Good. You're welcome, Mr. Bell. Bob. DOE is going to assume the responsibility and liability for the long term uh, use of the land and the, uh, the contaminants that may remain, say, below 10 feet in these areas, right? And this is in perpetuity, supposedly. Um, Dave has, has heard some of this conversation before. The, uh, what, what's going to happen in terms of long-term enforcement? So you have an industry in place. Uh, is, are there going to be periodic inspections to, uh, to, to make sure that the industry is not in violation of the agreement that they would not go below 10 feet and things like that? Uh, is there a plan in place with, yeah. for that? With our documentation. Yeah, we, uh, the, the backdrop, of course, is that this land, while DOE is forever responsible for ensuring that the cleanup objectives are met and people are kept out of harm's way, the land itself will change ownership. We, we do expect to transfer it to the Croat, to the industrial park, and they, in turn, hopefully will be able to market it. Um, the basic process involves DOE retaining an excavation permitting program, which will require that people who excavate below the depth that's been cleared um, interact with DOE to identify any, if any, necessary protective measures. Um, we're hopeful that for much of the site, and in fact, I, I'm certain we will, at the end of the day, confirm that for much of the site, the zone below 10 feet is just as clean as the zone above 10 feet and there's no need for special measures. As you can imagine, if the material is placed on the top and you clean it up, you wouldn't expect things deeper down. But there will need to be some control and then there will need to be some periodic monitoring. We have a program called the uh, Remediation Effectiveness Reporting Cycle or something like that, which basically involves the evaluation on a yearly basis and then a more formal evaluation every fifth year 
to look at our already implemented remedies, including land use controls, to see if, you know, people are holding to the requirements. We aren't going to leave anything in place and protect it only by institutional measures that could present any type of acute hazard. You know, if there's something that if someone were to go out there at night and gain access to it with a shovel and they could actually see a significant short exposure, high hazard situation, we're not going to leave anything like that in place. Everything we're leaving in place, which is pretty minimal, um, is the type of thing that would over a period of time and a chronic exposure lead to a risk. So we'll have controls, we'll have monitoring of those controls. All of those activities are overseen by the state of Tennessee and EPA. So I think we've got a pretty solid system. Okay, what's the depth that the, the, the ductwork array that's going to stay in place uh, uh, resides right now? Is it below 10 feet? Or? No, it's unique. Um, the ductwork Bob's referring to is the uh, ductwork that was used to carry power from the powerhouse area back to the gaseous diffusion plant. And it involves these uh, concrete con uh, ducts, they call them, um, that have wiring going through them. And the wiring is surrounded by a, a material called potting material, and then a sheath, and then an asbestos sheath. So there are, there's asbestos associated with the ductwork. Uh, the ducts themselves are about this big or, or larger. They're located about two feet below the ground surface. So in the case of the ductwork, we will, because they haven't been abandoned in place, we will have to have excavation controls below two feet. Now, um, it may be that some future developer wants to go below two feet, and if they want to do that, then they will need to manage the work and then anything they generate as part of the work in compliance with all worker safety and waste disposal systems. We would know because they're going to have to get an excavation, you know, they're going to have to coordinate the excavation. So. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Price. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. It was a good presentation. Appreciate it. Um, I had a question about the area where you're going to be placing a two feet of soil. Mm -hmm. And that was, I believe, um, that was the area of the old um, oil tracks. area. Fuel, and fuel um, yeah, if you want to pick up the photograph, the previous photograph to that. Okay, yeah, so that yes, area right the over there. Right. Um, Dave mentioned that there was asbestos in the soil. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that's right adjacent to the river. Is there consideration of um, bank erosion or protection of the bank when you put those, that two feet of soil, so that it doesn't um, undercut that, or um, particularly in air, in you know, flood situations or um, some <laughs> situation of hydraulic uh, difference in the in the <coughs> channel, um, is there going to be consideration put to that? That would be part of the design, the remedial design that we go through. Okay, so would there be some kind of um, wall built? Mm. Yeah. I don't know the estimate. It, it's an excellent question, and someone else asked it just a little while ago, and we don't have a complete answer to it yet. But the answer will need to be engineered measures to ensure that, that, that a reasonable level of control is placed over the asbestos. It's important, I think, just for perspective to understand that the levels of asbestos there are relatively low. Um, of course, there are a lot of naturally occurring forms of asbestos <coughs> along creeks around the country. Um, but it's also important to understand that asbestos, the problem with asbestos is when it gets dry and becomes airborne and you breathe it. So actually, and not that we want to wash stuff down the clinch, but <laughs> if, if some minimal amount were to be carried by the clinch and tied up down the sediments at the bottom of Watts Bar, that, that would not be a health issue. That would not be a problem. Um, but the idea is to contain the material on site. Yeah. Thank you. I, as a former asbestos <coughs> control type person for the county schools, asbestos is dangerous when it is friable, and that's mm -hmm. when it's dry. One of the ways that we can help encapsulate it in school systems is when we're working there is we keep it wet. Therefore, it is not a health hazard. So. Alfreda. I'm looking down 
jump through the Oop. list of questions. Greg, I'm sorry. Was, Greg was supposed to go next, but go ahead. I'm, I'm, oh, okay. And a number of them have been answered already, but what I wanted to ask Wendy is of the 1,400 acres in Zone 1, mm -hmm. the extent of uh, contaminated acreage that are included in 770 and the duck quarter and 901 which is contractor spoils oh, yeah. and down at the fly ash area let's and see look me i may need to get back with you on well actually I have that, but. this was in in the um selected remedy remedy number mm -hmm. two okay and covering those mm -hmm. and really what i'm getting at here is if the remediation occurs in those areas. Mm -hmm. Are we then, and I'm thinking that was like 10 acres, 10 acres, 10 acres, something like that? I, I can't remember anybody. Okay. Else. Seeing those are roughly lot, but, okay. Target. So say around 40 acres. Mm -hmm. All right. Are we saying that the rest of the 1,400 acres is ready for reindustrialization or commercial use right now? The, the, the other areas, each of, each of the exposure units for the other areas have been cleared. Now we've got other regulatory process to go through for the, to approve the transfer, but that is proceeding. So the other areas, I uh, don't believe we have any other gaps because of their zone one work. If you, if you, we can answer her question with a slide that's about is it the, eight slides back. If you go to the one that's yeah, light. that has the EUs on it. Uh, yeah, okay. go back. Really, what I'm getting at here is, it sounds like, except for these areas of concern, which are considerable as far as contamination may be, um, but you're almost there mm -hmm. as far as having Zone One ready for mm -hmm. commercial use. Am I understanding that's that correct. correctly? That's correct. Okay. Everything that's in light green has been cleaned up to meet soil criteria. But this area with the asbestos and then this area, somewhere in here there's an ash pile and then the yeah. contract spoils area. What this doesn't show is the, uh, the ducks. ducks, which cut across somewhere in here. But the top two feet have been cleaned up and that was the objective for those areas. So yeah, okay. but in the big picture, the soil has been cleaned up or proven to be clean, with very limited exceptions that basically proved too tough to us, we believe, to clean up. Is, is there a plan already in place in this proposal that would stop in this duct area, which is connecting Zone 1 and Zone 2? Is there something already planned that if those ducts are not removed, that they're capped off in some way where the contamination in zone two cannot backflow through those ducts. Yeah. The ducts were actually grouted up. So that's um, been done already. Yeah, right. yeah they okay. went in, poured concrete, and plugged them. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah, the, and this is a good slide to have up because you have 1,200 acres have been released for industrial use. Is DOE involved in any way in the solicitation of industry to come here with incentives, with a partnership with the state, city, or county? Or is it once you release it, it's completely out of your hands with the exception of the long-term money? Yeah. The, the, the basic model we're employing is that we get it cleaned up, we pass the tests imposed by the regulations in our oversight agencies, we do the paperwork that says it's good to go, and then we transfer it to the uh, industrial park authority. And we typically have given it to them for free so that they have an asset that they can market and hopefully make a little money on, because if they can't make money, then the, why would they do it? Um, so our, the thing that we do, hopefully, to promote the development is to get it cleaned up, make it suitable for redevelopment, and then provide it at essentially no cost to an independent organization, which actually has a citizen's board um, and markets the property. Now, that's the idea. <laughs> Um, what also happens, frankly, is that since we've got property out there now that hasn't been through the process, but we've also got people who are interested in the property, 
I do get involved. I, d I have been involved with tours of the property with prospects. They ask questions about its environmental condition. They ask about the transfer process. Right. So I've been involved some. But once, once we get the land transferred over, the idea is that DOE really isn't in the marketing business. That's better done, frankly. The government's not the best, <laughs> best outfitted position to do economic development. Private entities right. are. So we leave that to them. Oh, we do facilitate the information where, we're st where we still own the property. Right. And our, my job, our job to, to clear it off so that it can be transferred, yeah. but um, not the incentives and not right. the marketing type of things. Yeah, we're not allowed to use Wendy's money to provide incentives. You know, the money and, Congress and gives and us no, is for, I'm right. tearing down buildings and cleaning yeah. up soil. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Thank you have no say in terms of what kind of follow-up activity will be brought into this area than either? Um, well, when the, uh, we do have some. The, when the land is transferred, it's transferred via quick claim deed, and we are able to place into that deed any restrictions that, that we and our partners, EPA and TDEC, believe necessary to assure the protection of the remedy. So, for example, when we transfer land, we would say, hey, industry, you're not allowed to use the groundwater. Or you're not allowed to build, just to be silly, but illustrative, uh, daycare centers. So we can place limits on the type of, of uh, activity that takes place out there. And it's generally non-groundwater using industries. Um, beyond that, we don't try to pick winners and losers or Thank you. Okay, Ms. Daly. I'm sorry. <clears throat> I can't even see your point. Is it correct that there can be no use of the groundwater or the surface water by uh, any of the any of the <coughs> industrialization that goes on? Is that correct? It, they they, 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 they cannot they use the, the in past parcel transfers and in all likelihood in this too. There would be no allowance of groundwater use. Um, they typically also restrict the use of surface water that is entirely on site. So if you had groundwater oozing up into a wetland in the center of the site, for the same reasons you'd want to protect, you'd want to restrict groundwater use, you'd want to protect, uh, prevent that also. However, the, the beautiful Clinch River that flows past um, is available to them, and there's no reason why it shouldn't be, because there's no, there are no contamination issues of significance in the clinch. Okay. Um, and, and if that is so, then uh, it, will there be signage at those sites to let people know not to be, especially in the recreational areas? If, if signs are necessary, then signs will be present. There are sign, a lot of signs around now. Um, there wouldn't be signs saying, don't drill a well. Um, Right. right. But there would be, if there were a pond at the center of the site that we had reason to believe people shouldn't jump into or fish from or whatever, there would be signs. Okay. I have a couple others, if you don't mind. Um, can you give me any examples of other sites that have done something similar to this? And, uh, and if so, are we working with any of those? Uh, yeah. to check to see to, to see that we're in line with what the things that they looked at? Yeah. Um, I don't want to hog the ball here, but That's this is what I do, so I'm going to hog the ball. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I'm sit down here, there are other sites. Mm -hmm. um, uh, within the DOE complex, Oak Ridge, and I'm not just tooting Oak Ridge's horn, but Oak Ridge really is at the okay. forefront. Okay. We kind of have been the most, we're the furthest along in attempting to reindustrialize the site. Um, however, there's a site up in Ohio, the Mound site, um, that was abandoned by the government some time ago. Not abandoned, but cleaned up and transferred to a local industrial park authority. I've been up there a couple of times and have swapped notes with, with them. Um, within the Department of Defense, of course, as they close down bases, there are efforts to try to replace the jobs that are lost, a parallel endeavor to ours. Um, and I've had interaction with people in defense to see what they're doing. But I, I really, 
believe that we are kind of at the forefront when it comes to the reuse of formally utilized federal lands, particularly those that were associated with some type of hazardous material. I mean, there are other, uh, you know, open federal lands that were used for grazing that are being handed off to private sector for industrial development. That's, that's easy. But when it comes to this type of work, clean up and reuse, we're kind of charting some new territory. But yes, we coordinate with our, our sister agencies to the extent we both can gain from it. Okay, thank you. I, it's okay for me to go on? Um, I'm concerned, I guess I would like to know the reason, and if the reason is just the cost, or if there are other reasons uh, that uh, alternative two was the one chosen? Is that just because it's more cost effective? It's, it's really a combination of the cost, but the effectiveness of when we go in and to take the action, the ability to to get to a protectiveness level and I don't know if it's further detail. Yeah. Uh, in Wait, the case of, in the case of asbestos, putting workers in there to snuffle around and dig it all up no. is very expensive. Um, and does carry worker risks. I mean, we have means of keeping our workers safe, but if they tear off their face mask or something, they're not safe anymore. So it really is a risk and cost benefit analysis. If it was dirt, I'm sorry, if it was dirt cheap, very inexpensive and risk free, we'd clean it up. We'd clean it up. We've, we've spent millions and millions and millions of dollars to make those areas light green. And the areas that are left are the ones that we. It's in our judgment we're proposing should be managed in place. Okay. I guess that bothers me a little, um, especially since there are not a lot of other examples of where land has been turned over for public or private use. Um, so I am concerned about that. I'm also concerned about something when David Martin said it was like the hand. There is nothing there. There is no barrier except the lines on the map to keep the things in zone two, in zone two. Is that correct? Well, in zone two, we will be using a similar approach where wherever we believe it to be practicable and in the interest of the taxpayer to remove the contamination, we do so. So, yeah, he's correct. This is. This is the land mass that separates it from the river, but again, we're, we're moving in the direction of removing everything that we believe to be practicably removed. Um, I just wonder if that's going to be enough, and I'm, I'm sorry, but that's just, you know, that's just how I feel. Sure. Um, my last comment is, and it's a comment, not a question, but I really would like to have you, you all, those of you who know me know that stewardship is near and dear to my heart. I really would like to know more about the responsibility of the long-term stewardship. I would like to have a lot more detail on that. That, that. Appropriately so. And others have made the same comment. EPA, that's been, uh, if not the, if not the principal, a principal thrust of their efforts in trying to help us wrap this up. Um, we are, in fact, we're launching an effort to build a specific document to outline how we, we know the concept. People monitor, people make sure people aren't drilling wells. We're building a document that is an, essentially an implementation plan that, that describes the, the how. We kind of know what the what is, but we need more detail on the how so that people can be comfortable. We have a thoughtful plan for making sure that the, that the what is done well. So you'll be seeing more on that. Ridge Reservation holds an important place in our nation's history, and it continues to be a vital part of our national security and scientific research community. 
but parts of the reservation require cleanup as a result of decades of energy research. The U.S. Department of Energy looks to the Oak Ridge Site-Specific Advisory Board as the voice of the community on environmental issues. You're welcome to attend meetings of the Oak Ridge Site-Specific Advisory Board to learn more. Call us or visit our website.